Sumter County has about 98,000 people in it, about 575 square miles. This is a 55,000 square foot building that used to be a Walmart. The comm center here at the Sumter County Florida Sheriff's Office is the pulse, it's the center of the entire law enforcement operations and fire. 911 is here, we dispatched the sheriff, the county fire department, and four cities. In 2004, we had a major lightning strike during one of the hurricane events that was near us, and it uh, basically fried my 911 system. If your communications goes down or your 911 goes down, then you've got citizens at risk because they can't, you can't answer a 911 call for a fire or an ambulance or a car crash or someone's trying to break in their house or they're in an emergency situation because of the event that you're in. First of all, you don't have a sustainable electrical system without proper grounding and bonding. That is the basis of power quality. You don't get that right, you might as well forget putting the rest of the stuff in. It's not gonna work. It's like building a building without a foundation. It's like building a boat and drilling a hole in the damn thing. It's going to sink. You don't want to do that. You have to have the grounding and bonding right. That's where you start. The ground system was okay for, say, Walmart, but for the uh, high-tech equipment being used in it now, the grounding system wasn't appropriate. There was only one ground rod, and it was 240 ohms of resistance. And we found that different equipment was grounded individually, and a lot of the grounding conductors were too small. The building was originally grounded in the 1970s with a single galvanized eight-foot ground rod that, well, it was Mickey Mouse is the way it was installed. It may have met code at that point, but it was very poor. The resistance was extremely high. It was around 240 ohms. That's ridiculous. Code asked for 25. IEEE says five. We say less than five. We would have loved to have put a big counterpoise around the facility, but unfortunately, it's paved or concrete, you can't do that. We were limited by the property line. We couldn't put a big bond ring out back, so we had to run a T ground. It's just as effective, it's just not quite as desirable. We was shooting for as low of, of resistance as we could get, so we drove rods 60 feet deep till we got below one ohm, and we decided to use three uh, ground rods in, in parallel with each other. There was an original ring ground around the tower. We left that alone and just and installed a new 4 aught ring ground ar around that as well. The tower was already installed. All the bonding for the tower was already installed. And we couldn't just dig it up. So we said, okay, we tested it. It didn't meet our standards. We're just going to put all new in. We also put two leads on each uh, tower leg down to that radial. One of the leads uh, was tied in at the main ground cable leading to the main ground bus. At the base of the tower there was uh, the, the plates that that bolted it to the concrete uh, pillars. Uh, the plates was too small to exothermic weld properly so we welded some quarter inch plate to the bottom of the tower legs so that we could put in an exothermic weld instead of a bolt connection. The coax that comes down the tower makes a 90 degree turn as it heads towards the entrance shield. There are a device that you can put around the coax that is metallic that has a lead. You tie that lead to a ground bus bar. In effect, you're stripping the energy that follows the shield in a lightning strike off and we're sending it straight directly to a ground system directly below it. Lightning doesn't like to go around corners, period. So we're giving it a direct path into the earth where the coax is going the other direction. When we reach the building entrance shield, we have a secondary shield protection system. So we've redundant protected from lightning entering the building on the coax shield. Additionally, in the communication computer room, there are lightning arresters and it is bonded again to the shields. So there's three layers of protection. When the tower was installed, it was not bonded to the service entrance, main, or the main grounding. We put in a bond bar on the wall and all of the grounds from all throughout the building terminate at that point, including the tower, including the transformers, including the switchgear, everything bonds at that point. The whole point of bonding is to find a very sustainable, robust path for lightning energy, in most cases, to travel to a central grounding point. It has to be very robust and it can't be made with poor fasteners. It can't be a loose connection. It can't be a minimal contact connection. It needs to be double lugged and it needs to be firmly connected, period. We decided to use 4-aught cable so it would carry a lot more lightning current. 
instead of number two. When you're dealing with lightning, you're dealing with broad spectrum energy. You don't know how much current, you don't know how much amperage, but it's usually a lot more than the service entrance of the building. So why would you use a wire that typically is a lot smaller than the service entrance feeder wires to try and handle lightning energy? You have to use a large stranded conductor. First of all, lightning is a multi-frequency event. It's not 60 hertz energy, it's broad spectrum. Lightning energy, high frequency part of it, travels on the skin of the wire, not in the center of the conductor. I recommend a minimum of 4 out. In the electrical room are 480 volt panels that are fed from the upstairs main distribution panels. There's also two transformers and there are 208 panels that feed the communication center equipment. Initially these were bonded to building steel. That was inadequate and inappropriate because we can't be sure it was contiguous back to the mains. So we regrounded those using 4 out directly back to the primary bonding point of the service entrance mains. Inside that room is also where the coax is entered from, from the tower. There is a bonding plate in that room which we've terminated all the grounds from the transformers and the home run grounds from the communications room and also from the computer room. The grounding bus bar is where all the grounds terminate with the exception of the two grounds for the transformers. They actually home run back to the XO bond point outside. But that is the epicenter where all of the bonding conductors go outside towards the grounding. In the communication center, there is a computer room which also handles some radio communications equipment and there's also a telecommunications room where the 911 equipment is located. Each one of those rooms has a large copper grounding bar that is once again connected back to that central bonding point in the electrical room and that goes back to the mains. All the equipment that requires grounding and bonding will be home run bonded to those panels. The surge protection started at the main panels outside, the main disconnects, and the additional layers were put on the main panel boards and all distribution and sub panels throughout the building. At the service entrance, we have two overhead fed main disconnects. The XO bonds are made at that point and we installed two surge suppressors, one for each main with their own disconnect. So they're serviceable without turning the power off to the building. Inside on the two main panel boards, we added two 100 KA TG 100s with disconnects, which is a copy of what we did on the outside. So we have 200 KA of protection to that point. After that point, we have 100 KA single units on each of the distribution panels that feed the panels for the communications room and also all the other services of the building. The intention was to take anything that is critical and get it off of a panel that may have a load that could be negative for it. In other words, air conditioning systems, outside loads. We don't want anything on those panels that could have a negative effect on that communications room. Keep in mind, Surge protectors protect from line to neutral and also line to ground. Well, if you're diverting a surge event to ground and the neutral and ground are bonded, you could end up giving your equipment electrical enema if you don't have a good ground. This is a communication center for the entire sheriff's department of this county. Therefore, it is critical. Therefore, it has to have redundancy. Therefore, it has two generators and two transfer switches. They were not bonded properly when they were originally installed. The bonding on the one generator was inappropriate. It was basically a sheet metal screw, a ferrous sheet metal screw, to a galvanized clamp to a painted piece of steel. You can't get much worse a connection than that. So we rebonded them so they all are part of the electrical system and everything is connected together with 4 up. When you look at a room that cost over a million dollars to spend uh, $38,000, $40,000 to ground it is minimal. You can't afford not to do it, let's put it that way. You can't afford not to because in, in the weather situations in this area, you're going to get hit by lightning sooner or later. Had we had the opportunity to begin from square zero and this was fresh construction, we could have done this a lot more cost effectively because we could have taken advantage of you for bonding and a lot of other things. With all this equipment in place and the grounding in place, it makes me feel that I have done everything that I can to protect this building and protect this public. That doesn't mean that you're not going to have a problem. Nothing's perfect in this world, but I have done everything that's feasible, re reasonably feasible to protect this building.